over the last six months. My family and I have been going through this transition, this transformation of trading in our status as cheese-loving, Green Bay Packer cheering, 50 degree below zero tolerating Wisconsinites to become Floridians. We've swiped out our snowblower for a swimming pool. I'm still trying to figure out which of those is really more work. <laughs> We've put all of our sweaters up in storage on the shelves, although I'm sure we're going to be reaching for them when it drops all the way to 70 degrees. And over the last six months, I would like to stand here and, and have the kind of confidence that Paul has in his letter to Romans, right? He seems so certain. He seems so convinced and sure of God's presence in his life. I'd love to stand here and tell you that neither moving a thousands of miles across country or trying to navigate Florida real estate or trying to deal with grass and weeds that seem to grow in the blink of an eye nor trying to learn a whole new church structure and system and group of people that nothing over the last six months has separated me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But I also need to be honest that over the last six months, a word that I have found my prayer life returning to time and time again is the word for this morning from Brian McLaren's book, Naked Spirituality. Why? That question, why, which I think is so central and actually is a beautiful part and an echo to the confidence that Paul has this morning. You see, Paul also asked a series of questions in the passage that Fred just read for you. He starts off by asking these questions, who will, who, if God is for us, who is against us? Who can bring any charges against God's elect? Who can condemn? Who can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? And Paul, as he's asking those questions, right? He gets so wrapped up, as Paul sometimes does, in his own rhetoric that, that those questions kind of become rhetorical, right? We think that we know the right answers to all of those questions, that it should be no, nothing, not zip, zilch, zero, nothing should in this world should be able to separate us from God's love. And, and we think that that's the only right answer to those questions. But if we step back and really let those questions speak to our life and have some conversation with our life, I think all of us bring experiences and encounters when maybe we'd answer those questions just a little bit differently. If God is for us, who can be against us, Paul asks this morning. And, and perhaps each and every one of us has had that experience of, of someone in our life who has stood in our way. You've had to work with that person. I mean, you know that person, right? The one who's, whose voice is like nails on a chalkboard and it, it just kind of sends your stomach in churns and turns it in knots. We've each had those moments when we've, we've butted heads with someone, right? Can we really sit here this morning and say that, that we've never had a nemesis, we've never had an enemy, we've never got an argument with someone else and, and had that difference break down a relationship. And even if you have led that kind of semi-charmed life where you've never butted heads with anyone, at least culturally speaking, we do this all the time. Look at our whole political system, right? It operates right now by each political party defining itself as over and against the other. And the other is always the one to blame for the reason why nothing is happening, right? We hear that story time and time again. Socially speaking, we do this. We separate ourselves out economically, racially, by religion, by social class, by regions, all of these different ways that we define those who are others 
all around us. And then, to be honest, friends, what we often do is treat those others as not only foe, but also a scapegoat for all of the problems that ills our societies, right? We do this time and time again. So when Paul says, if God is for us, who is against us? Perhaps there's another answer besides no one. Look at the second question. Who can bring any charges against God's elect. I don't think Paul could have ever envisioned or imagined just how litigious our society can be. Courts increasingly have power within our world, and that comes with both positives and negatives. We saw the positive this week as we took a step forward towards marriage equality in our own state, but we also know that courts here in our own state are not as colorblind as we would like them to be, right? And so who can bring any charges against God's elect? We open our newspaper and we see time and time again the ways that injustice happens all around us. Who can condemn? Paul asked us this morning. And, and perhaps Paul never had to endure middle school, right? Wandering down those halls and the social structures that govern those relationships, or maybe he never had to sit through a staffing performance review. But brothers and sisters, we know, we have experiences and encounters where we have been judged, where we've been judged by all sorts of criteria that maybe we thought were unfair and unjust. And so we land in that last question, who can separate us from the love of God and, and look back? All of those experiences, all of those encounters that sit within us and cause such tension can sometimes make it feel like God is distant and disinterested in our lives, that God's love isn't as prominent as we'd like it to be. And so we wrestle with all of that, and perhaps we start to realize that, that Paul's answers, Paul's responses, that no one, nothing, not a zip, zilch, zero would be able to separate us from God. Maybe we also need to lay those experiences and events where we have felt some tension on the table and ask that question, the word for our today, why? Why is that so? Why is there that tension within our lives today? I remember this passage was one that I preached on as part of my doctoral dissertation. And I was interviewing someone after the sermon on this passage, and, and he reflected back. He said, Wes, you know, I've been thinking about these questions, and I'm, I'm sort of taking it a different direction than Paul, but, but I, I sometimes separate myself from God's love. I sometimes take a step away from God when I leave the safety of the sanctuary, and I act as though God was left I sometimes forget to listen for God. I sometimes don't remember God's love and the words I say or the actions I offer to others. I can separate myself from God. When we sit with that question, why, it can sometimes cause us to shift uncomfortably in our pews, right? I mean, I mean, we sort of get this understanding as people of faith that we're supposed to be super spiritual answer people, right? That there shouldn't be any question in this world that as people of faith we can't answer. So why is the sky blue? Or why do bad things happen to good people? Or, or why are there so many songs about rainbows, right? All of those great why questions. And, and we've sort of been indoctrinated, I think, since very young children to think that there is an answer to every single question. And our, our purpose in life is to try to find that right answer. That's what we learn in education, right? We know that the right answer to the question gets us an A on a paper. We learn that the right answer to the question gets us the job. We learn that the right answer to the question can, can earn us the accolades and affirmation and adoration of countless people around us. And so we keep searching for the answers time and time again. But brothers and sisters, maybe, 
maybe the vision for the church today, in this time and space, should not be trying to present pre-packaged, easy-to-swallow answers to the world around us. Maybe we should be inviting the world around us into this place to live with the questions. These beautiful questions like, why? And sometimes I think we, we, we tend to suppose that the word, that the question why is only about those negative places, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? But the question why can also start to break open and probe and poke at the mysteries beyond us, right? Mysteries that are beautiful and wonderful. Think about it this way. You and I, over the last 24 hours, have lost about 40,000 skin cells. It's actually what makes up the majority of dust and dirt in your house. You might want to go home and vacuum after the sermon today, right? But even though in the last 24 hours we lost that many skin cells, that's a lot. When you and I looked in the mirror this morning, we, didn't, we weren't startled. We weren't surprised. We recognized ourselves. Why? How does that happen? How? That's so beautiful and wonderful. Or think about it this way. We're about halfway through the worship service. And some of the things that we have sang and some of the things that we have said and some of the things that you have heard this morning have been meaningful. They've, they've touched a deep place in your life and, and maybe some of the things haven't. And rather than just leaving it at a surface level of, I like that or I didn't like that, question why invites you a little deeper into the conversation. Why was that hymn meaningful? Why did those words resonate? Why did that image not quite connect for me? You see, the question why pulls and pokes and prods at all the mysteries of life, and perhaps the vision of the church could be, might be, laying those questions out, not with the hope that we'll ever find all the answers, that we might discuss them, listen to each other's responses and insights and understandings, and have a richer sense of, of the mysteries that surround us. That's what I think Paul was pointing at. That's what I think can be so powerful about our lives is, you see, we're not just the question. We're also this wonderful sense of certainty as well. And that's, that's where that piece of paper that you received this morning comes into hand. That's what our children have already heard about. As you take it into your hand, you'll see that there's a wonderful, colorful side to some of them. Some say the same on both. But, but if you find the one side, what I want you to do is something very important with this. I want you to take that side and I want you to write down one question that you have. One why question you might have. It, it might be, why is there so much violence in our world today? We've heard news story after news story about that. Or maybe your question is, is a bit more theological. Why is God moving in this way? Or, or where is God in this moment? Think about a question that's sitting in your heart this morning. And then on that same piece of paper, on the same side, I want you to also write down a place where you feel confident and certain and sure in your faith this morning. Maybe you were out at the beach this week, and as the sun was setting, you felt God's presence so certain and sure. Or maybe you've had some guests in your house this week, and, and through the laughter over meals, you felt God's presence in such a real way. Or, or maybe you've had a new insight into your faith journey this week. Where are you certain and sure? Where are there questions still bubbling and roaming around your heart? I want you to write that down on the piece of paper. And on this, my six month anniversary, I am certain. And I am sure that the Spirit of God is moving in our ministry together, that God is guiding us deeper into this journey of faith. And what I am so certain of is that I cannot wait to explore all the wonderful questions of faith with you in the months and 
years to come. Thanks be to God. Let us be in the spirit of prayer, offering to God our certainties and questions in this time of silence.